The Dynasty wide receiver landscape has been shaken up after this last year, so let's talk about it. My name is Cameron Lawrence with the Fantasy Football Fellows, and we're going to put the top 20 Dynasty wide receivers into tiers. I don't want to waste any of your time, so hit that subscribe button, turn on those notifications, and let's start with our Tier S players, that top tier. First guy we got, Mr. Justin Jefferson. I know he was hurt. I know he's got quarterback issues. But guys, Justin Jefferson had 1,000 receiving yards this season. Again, he only played 10 games, and he had over 1,000 receiving yards. He averaged 98.3 yards per game for his career. This dude does not get rattled. And then I know what you're saying. I brought it up. He's got quarterback issues. What happens if Kirk leaves? Can you really put him over C.D. Lamb, who's got Dak Prescott, Jamar Chase, who's got Joe Burrow? Yeah, because in his four healthy games to close out the season with Nick Mullins, he averaged 22.2 fantasy points per game. He was just fine. In fact, he was great over those last four games. So I'm not worried about Justin Jefferson whatsoever. And his worst season so far in the NFL, he was the wide receiver nine in points per game. He's been top five in points per game every year since. I wouldn't think about it. I'm keeping him as my dynasty wide receiver one. But I do think the other two guys do have an argument, at least, to be the dynasty wide receiver one. But there's no way Jefferson falls lower than three. Second wide receiver is Jamar Chase. He's averaged 18.2 fantasy points per game for his career. Only five other players averaged that this season. And yeah, he did that all with Joe Burrow being injured to start the season. Joe Burrow not finishing the season. T. Higgins being in and out of the lineup. The Bengals just looking bad as a whole. Moving forward, Burrow's going to be there. He'll be there. T. Higgins may not, but I don't think that truly affects Jamar Chase. So Burrow's going to be healthy next year. He should be healthy next year. I know these last two years have been a little disappointing if you've taken Jamar Chase. But there's really nothing you can be upset about because, like I said, averaging 18.2 fantasy points per game for his career, he's one of the few guys to put up two 50-point games in the last three seasons. He is an explosive player. He needs to be top three. And the last guy in this top three list is C.D. Lamb. 28 fantasy points per game for C.D. Lamb from week eight on. That was after his bye. 28 fantasy points per game. That is that is like Christian McCaffrey numbers. That's unbelievable. If we remember last year, we talked a little bit of Dynasty um, on our page. And it was just Je Jefferson and just Chase in the Tier S. Now we have to move in CeeDee Lamb because what we saw from him was unreal. That stretch he had was ridiculous. And it does give him, a, I think, a great case to be the Dynasty wide receiver. One, I still have Jefferson and Chase slightly ahead of him. But like I said, 28 fantasy points per game from week eight on is crazy. Um, through, uh, three years ago, 79 receptions on 120 targets, 1,100 yards, and six touchdowns. Two, uh, two years ago, 107 receptions, 156 targets, 1,359 yards, and nine touchdowns. This last season, 135 receptions, 181 targets, 1,749 yards, and 12 touchdowns. So he's progressed every single year. He is a bona fide superstar at this point. There is no doubting C.D. Lamb. And in fact, like I said, he does have an argument for that wide receiver one spot because his best season this year, 330, 335 half PPR fantasy points per game. Jefferson's best year last year, 304. Chase's best year was only 264. So he has had the biggest peak so far. The only question is, Dak is on the last year of his contract. Do the Cowboys move off of him? Do they keep him? If, as long as Dak is there, I really do think CD's got a very, very strong argument to be the Dynasty wide receiver one. In any Dynasty draft, these three should be the first three taken, I guess, unless it is super flex. All righty, let's move on to our Tier A wide receivers. As you can see, we have five in this tier instead of three. We start with Amon Ra St. Brown, and I, I do believe Amon Ra is on that edge. He is, for me, the only wide receiver on that edge of moving up to Tier S. He's been getting better each year, just like I said with C.D. Lamb. 164 targets this year on 119 receptions, 1,515 yards. And the big thing for me, double-digit touchdowns. I didn't know if he was going to be a huge touchdown threat. Maybe he was just going to be a uh, possession receiver. But he proved this year he can put up double-digit touchdowns. He can average 20 fantasy points per game. He's top seven in fantasy yards per route run and yards per route run. And he proved, like I said, can be a double-digit guy. And a lot like CeeDee Lamb, he plays majority of his routes in the slot, fifth in slot snaps and fifth in target share, which are both 
huge. This guy is not going anywhere. He is young, like the th first three that I talked about. If you have Amon Ra on your team, you should be extremely happy, and I would not move him unless I'm getting another one of these top three guys or the craziest package overall. Next is A.J. Brown, but before I talk about A.J. Brown, I do want to acknowledge we do not have any rookies on this list. So if you're looking for Marvin Harrison Jr., you're like, ooh, maybe he should be up here. We have no rookies yet. We're going to wait till after the combine, after the draft, actually, and then we're going to redo our list with the rookies added. So don't worry, no rookies yet, but rookies coming in a month or two. Like I said, A.J. Brown. The thing that really does excite me about A.J. Brown is his two years in Philly, we've seen two completely different seasons. 2022, 146 targets, 88 receptions, 1,496 yards, 17 yards per reception, and 11 receiving touchdowns, 17.6 fantasy points per game. This last year, 158 targets, 106 receptions, so 14 more, for 1,456 yards, so he's still within 40 yards of 2022, but only 13.7 yards per reception and 7 touchdowns, still averaging 17 fantasy points per game. We've seen him be that just strictly big play guy, and now we're seeing him more of a possession wide receiver. The bigger thing for me, too, this was something that I thought the gap was going to close, but he widened the gap in target share between him and Devonta Smith. He had a 30% target share to Devonta's 22%. I know he's got those off-field issues, right? It's all over Twitter and everything, but he has a massive contract that is going to be very difficult to move for at least the next two years. So he is going to be in Philadelphia along with Jalen Hurts. He should be good to go moving forward. They're going to keep feeding him the ball. I would not worry about that with A.J. Brown. Sixth on this list is Garrett Wilson. Fourth in targets this year, but only got 57% of them. Uh, 95 receptions, 168 targets. Very Devontae Adams-esque of last year from what we saw from him. His pure volume stats are fantastic, and that should get you excited because he is – the passing offense, right? Him and Brees Hall, and obviously as the wide receiver, he's going to get more downfield. But with Zach Wilson, you're just not going to see great efficiency stats at the wide receiver position. You're just not. It's impossible with Zach Wilson as your quarterback. Garrett Wilson has done the best he can over the last two years. He will get Aaron Rodgers in this next season. So even if Rodgers is 30% of himself, he's better than Zach Wilson. And then moving forward, you got to – Ugh, excuse me, you got to believe it can't get worse than what we've seen. So Garrett Wilson has shown extreme talent. He can be really, really good. That's what keeps him up here at six, a lot based on what we think we're going to see from him. At seven is Puka Nakua. And some of you are like, man, this dude should be S tier. Just broke the receiving record, reception record, 105 receptions, 1,496 yards. Some of you are like, pump the brakes. Matthew Stafford's going to retire soon. Cooper Cup coming in. I think both sides are valid. That's why he lands here at seven for us. He was fifth in yards after catch and sixth in yards per route run. So when he did get the ball in his hands, he made things happen. He got the ball thrown to him a ton. But like I said, the big mystery here, Cooper Cup coming back full time, Matthew Stafford's future. What does that all mean? I'm not 100% sure. But what we do know is you don't just fluke into 105 receptions and 1,496 yards as a rookie. This guy is really good, and he's going to be good for a while. At eight is Tyreek Hill. He's our first guy over 26 years old on this list. He is 29 and has flirted with the idea of retiring at age 30. That's really the only reason he could be the slow, because as long as he's on the field, he's a top three wide receiver. Now, 119 targets and a 700, 119 receptions, excuse me, and 170 targets with 1,700 plus yards in back-to-back -back years is insane. And the fact he got better this year after what we saw last year, like I said, the only reason he's lower is because of age, and he's talked about maybe an earlier retirement. As but as long as he's on the field, he is a top three wide receiver. And now we move on to tier B, which is our largest tier with eight players in it. I think this comes down to what I talked about last year, that there are only a couple of guys that I think are bona fide fantasy wide receiver ones, but there are a ton of players who fit into that fantasy wide receiver two category. And so obviously this is going to be a little bit bigger. These are going to be your fringe wide receiver one guys. At nine is going to be Chris Olave, very similar to Garrett Wilson, right? He's put up good stats, not had great quarterback work, 
but what the problem is going to be is there's not an Aaron Rodgers coming in, right? He has Derek Carr at least one more season, who was top 15 in attempts, so at least he's throwing the ball. And Chris Olave was fourth in deep targets and third in unreals air yards, but he was only top 20 in yards per run targets and receiving yards. So there was the, the, just that misconnection. It's similar to what we saw with Devontae Adams, actually, uh, when Carr was in Las Vegas. The big thing, though, was that Der- Devontae Adams had 180 targets. Chris Olave did not have that this last year. So we're betting on the potential here of Chris Olave from what we've seen on the field. There's not as many stats to necessarily back up how great he has been, but he has shown enough in his first two seasons to keep him this high on the list. And I feel like at worst with Chris Olave, you're getting a top 15 wide receiver. Like I think that's his going to be his floor moving forward. Next is DJ Moore, a guy who I personally have higher than Chris Olave in my dynasty rankings, but we're going off our fellas consensus rankings, which you can find in our chalkboard. Link will be in the bio of the top 30 quarterbacks, top 30 tight ends, top 50 running backs and wide receivers in dynasty. Like I said, free in our chalkboard, which is in our bio. I really like DJ Moore. He had a career high in receptions, yards, touchdowns, and fantasy points per game this last year. He was 10th in targets here, eighth in air yards, fifth in deep targets, eighth in yards after catch. Top 15 at both fantasy points per target and yards per route run. At a minimum, he keeps the same offense and they add another good outside weapon, maybe Marvin Harrison. But at this point, I don't think that's the route they go. I think they're very strongly leaning towards adding Caleb Williams. They traded for DJ Moore last year with the intent of him being their wide receiver one, of him being an alpha, and he showed that he can definitely do that. So I think they keep DJ Moore. I think he continues to play very, very well. And so, yeah, he finished wide receiver six this next year. I think he could do that for the next three to five years. At 11, we start getting into these NFL wide receiver twos with Jalen Waddle. Let's be honest, from a fantasy perspective, last year was disappointing. 72 receptions on 104 targets, 1,014 yards and four touchdowns. Wasn't exactly what you wanted to see. It was similar to what he had last year, except he's down 300 receiving yards because his yards per reception went from 18.1 to 14.1, which is honestly probably more realistic. There are very few guys who can maintain decent volume and 18 yards per reception. He, But he did average almost a reception more per game because he did only play 14 games. And he has shown him the ability to play both the field stretcher and the possession guy like he did in his first year when he broke 100 receptions. The problem, the thing for Jalen Waddell is, okay, how is he going to coexist with Tyreek Hill? We know Tyreek Hill is 170 targets per year, no matter what, as long as he's on the field. If, like I said earlier, Tyreek decides to retire early, that's huge. But it'll be interesting to see how Jalen Waddell is moving forward. We know he's an extremely talented wide receiver. We know he's in an offense that can put up a lot of points. Can he continue to take that next step forward? At 12 is Brandon Ayuk, and you know what? He's not happy right now. He he put it all over social media right after that Super Bowl loss. He wants an extension. I don't think he's on this team without an extension. I don't know if they can give him one right now. He was 30th in targets and 24th in receptions this last year, but 7th in receiving yards and 3rd in routes run. Um, and then second in yards per reception, right? So he wasn't getting the volume he wanted, right? Only saw 105 targets, but the efficiency, 17.9 yards per reception, like I said, seventh in receiving yards, was off the charge, 15.6 points. So he did take that step forward. We saw how great of a route runner he is. If he can go be an alpha somewhere, I think 12 could end up being too low for Brandon Ayuk. If he maintain or stays on the 49ers, I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility. He's a 15 points per game kind of guy. 12 feels right, especially for the age that he is at uh, right now. 13 is Michael Pittman Jr., another free agent, but it sounds like the Colts are leaning towards franchise tagging him, which wouldn't be the worst thing because he was the alpha this year. He saw 156 targets, 109 receptions, 1,152 yards, and four touchdowns. The issue with Michael Pittman is that efficiency, like we talked about with Brandon Ayuk, isn't there. He's averaged under 11 11 yards per reception two years in a row. And he's yet to score over six touchdowns in a season. He kind of feels like DJ Moore, except he doesn't get the ball down the field uh, before DJ Moore broke out this last year. 
But he is a top 15 option if he is in Indianapolis this next year because he is that clear number one. I think if he goes anywhere, there are very few places where he's not going to go and be a clear number one, very few teams that will sign him. So I think he maintains, kind of like Chris Olave, his floor is probably wide receiver 15 through 17. So wide receiver 13 in Dynasty at only 25 years of age is a good spot for Michael Pittman. At 14 is another wide receiver too. It's Devonta Smith. Um, I talked about it earlier. With A.J. Brown, I thought that Devonta Smith was going to lead this team in targets. Instead, A.J. Brown widened that gap, had 156 targets to Devonta's 112 after Devonta had 136 last season. 81 receptions, 1,066 yards. He did see his yards per reception go from 12.6, climb up a little bit to 13.2. And I do think the thing that's nice to see for Devonta Smith is that the touchdowns remained at 7. So it really wasn't disappointing. He still had 14.2 fantasy points per game. He did have some big games, but I think he is a top-tier wide receiver, too. I think he's slightly below that Jalen Waddle, obviously, from where we have him in the rankings. But for him, his ceiling is going to rely on a lot on Jalen Hurts. In this offense, can Jalen Hurts continue to maintain two great wide receivers? Can he continue to throw the ball extremely well? Hopefully, this you know move, moving forward, they're able to kind of fix the offense from that downfall they had over the last part of the year. Number 15 is another free agent, T. Higgins, and he, I think, is going to be the wide receiver that moves. I don't think the Bengals can bring him back. Uh, If they do, it's on a um, franchise tag. And I'm going to be honest, I'm disappointed with how T. Higgins has, you know, looked. Uh, 2021, we saw, you know, he had 74 receptions on 110 targets, 1,091 yards and six touchdowns, 15.7 fantasy points per game in his first year with Jamar Chase. So we thought, hey, they could coexist. Last two years ago, 2022, 13.1 fantasy points per game. Last year, 11.5. Just never could get going from an injury perspective. Obviously, missing Burrow doesn't help either. But I think T. Higgins could go to a team like the Chiefs. Um, I think he, you know, it depends what he's going to chase. If he's truly chasing the bag, probably doesn't end up on a team like Kansas City. For sure, could get um, franchise tagged. But I think we see a bounce back this year to that 15 between 14 and 16 fantasy points a game from T Higgins. And our last guy in tier B is DK Metcalf. And with Geno Smith, it's really been the tail two seasons with um, DK in 2022. He was a safety blanket guy, 141 targets, 90 receptions, only 1,048 yards on 11.6 yards per reception and six touchdowns, 13.3 fantasy points per game. This last year, he was out targeted by Tyler Lockett. Tyler Lockett had 13 more receptions than him. He only had 120 targets, only 66 receptions, but he saw 1,114 yards on 16.9 yards per reception and eight touchdowns and actually had more fantasy points than he did the last season. I think this is what they want DK to be. They want him to be more of that field stretcher, especially with JSN coming in. Lockett's only getting older. I think DK is in a spot where he's going to see more targets come in this next year. I think he's going to really emerge. They're going to continue to use him as that alpha out there, and we're going to see more of a return, hopefully, to what we saw in 2020 because, honestly, his stats were pretty similar. He had a higher yards per reception. He only saw nine more targets in 2020 but caught 17 more passes. So I think if that connection, if Geno can continue to play or start playing at a little bit of a higher level, I think DK is going to be great moving forward. Seeing him back up around eight touchdowns, he should be a double-digit touchdown guy. So, yeah, that that – you know, for me, I think DK at 16 is probably pretty good. I don't think we're going to see a top eight wide receiver finish really from DK moving forward, but I think he can flirt with that top 10, top 12. Alrighty, and now we have tier C, and I'm going to be honest, tier C is maybe a half quarter step even below tier B. For me, it's these younger guys who looked fantastic this year. It's just have some question marks moving forward, and can they do it for more than one season? At 17 is Rasheed Rice. And a lot of people liked him coming out at SMU, but a lot of people were just like, oh, it's another Sky Moore. Stay away just because he's a Chiefs wide receiver. You don't want him. And he did start off a little slower, right? And But in the second half of the season, the dude was amazing. Drew nine targets a game, seven receptions a game, averaged 86 receiving yards a game, let all wide receivers in that stretch from week 12 on with 402 yards after the catch. Was the wide receiver four over that time? Lucas likes to say Amon Ra esque. I'm I don't quote go quite that far, but it was a fantastic stress from Rasheed Rice and should make you excited. 
The problem for Rasheed Rice is what does it look like when they bring in another wide receiver? If they bring in like a guy I said earlier, maybe like a T. Higgins, I don't think it actually affects him too much. This team threw the ball the third most amount. T. Higgins can be very different than Rasheed Rice. It would be if it's like a Michael Pittman, um, you know, a guy who's going to play across the middle, Roma Dunze, uh, Malik Neighbors, which I don't think they bring in someone like that. I don't think they go out and trade up to the top of the draft to get someone like that. Um, so it'll be interesting to see. I think Rasheed Rice is the safest of this tier. That's why I have him first. I don't think his gonna, role is going to change a ton. And to be the third wide receiver, really in Patrick Mahomes' career behind Travis Kelsey and Tyreek Hill that he actually trusts, I think is huge for him. And I think I think he's going to take that next step forward. Um, and I would not be upset if you traded any of those guys in that t- that tier above him to go get Rasheed Rice. He was one of the ones that we really debated on maybe moving up to tier B. At 18 is Nico Collins. Going into 2023, you know, you looked at Houston and you're like, hey, geez, do we really want to trust this Houston offense? There's a lot of go- lot going on. You know, he's a guy maybe you can take a flyer on. And then he was fantastic. Wide receiver 12 in points per game. Wide, re- wide receiver 12 in points. Wide receiver 7 in points per game. 80 receptions on 109 targets, 1,300 yards, and 8 touchdowns. He had three games with over 34 um, fantasy points. From week 11 to the end of the season, wide receiver 6, wide receiver 4 in points per game. The thing is, I don't think he can keep up this same efficiency. He's going to need a lot more targets than 109 to catch 80 passes for 1,300 yards and 8 touchdowns this next year. Maybe touchdowns can say, but he's going to need to see more volume, especially with Tank Dell coming back, especially with them maybe bolstering up that um, running back room, maybe even bringing in another wide receiver. I think he's going to need to see more targets, so we'll see if he can be a target hog this next season to propel himself. Right now, if you look at like an underdog best ball draft, people have him going as a wide receiver 13. For me, that's a little bit rich. I'm not quite in. I'm not quite sold on Nico Collins, and another big reason, he did fantastic when Tank Dell was out. What does it look like when Tank Dell's back? Because Tank Dell looked amazing for those couple of games um, before he got hurt, so there's a lot of question marks around Nico Collins. But I do think that he's legit. I think I think at the very least he's a top 24 guy. You might be disappointed if you're thinking he can be better. That's why he finds himself in this tier. At 19 is Drake London. Drake London is kind of that opposite, right? We didn't, haven't seen that spark yet. We haven't seen the splash from Drake London yet. But he's moving on from Desmond Ritter. He's moving on from Arthur Smith, who only threw the ball 25 times a game last year. Just for comparison, I'm comparing him to the Seahawks because they're about as middle of the pack as you can get. They threw the ball 34 times last year. So the, just the fact that they could see you know, 9, 10, 11, 12 more attempts coming from the passing side means that there will be enough for him, for Pitts, um, for Bijan, if they bring in somebody else. He's seen at least 110 targets over the last two seasons, about 70 receptions, 900 yards. He hasn't scored many touchdowns, but nobody on the team has. We talked about Kyle Pitts, hasn't scored many. Desmond Ritter only had 12 passing touchdowns all of last year. So his fantasy points per game have been extremely low. Drake London is a guy I would love to go buy right now if you can, just because I think he's going to be about at his floor as far as fantasy goes, if they bring in like a Justin Fields, I think that could be huge for Drake London. Or if they bring in a Kirk Cousins, I think that could be even bigger. And the last guy we're going to talk about in depth is Jordan Addison. I honestly think Jordan Addison did everything you could have asked for him this year. He played well when Justin Jefferson was on the field. He played well um, you know, when they had the backup wide receivers in. He had a wide receiver one finish against Cincinnati with Jefferson in the game with a backup quarterback. 108 targets, 70 receptions, 911 yards, 13 yards per reception. He was a big play threat, and he scored 10 receiving touchdowns. Um, So you come into next year, you're hoping Kirk Cousins is back from a fantasy perspective. If not, that means they're probably drafting a guy. um, This, you know, in taking a guy in the draft, it's probably going to be better than what we saw from the uh, um, backup situation that they had, starting three different quarterbacks. I don't want to say it's for sure going to be better, but it probably will be. And having Jefferson on the field definitely helps just open up the field for him as a whole. All right, that wraps up the top 20 we're going to talk about in person. I'm going to give you five extra guys real quick. Zay Flowers is that only other guy that really fits into this tier for me. He's very similar to what I think like a Jordan Addison. 
Um, it looked like he met expectations this year, probably surpassed expectations. But what does this Baltimore offense look like moving forward? Moving into Tier D, we got two young guys, two older guys. Jeff, Jackson Smith and Jigba, you know, we didn't exactly see it this year, but still believe in that talent. Tyler Locke getting older should get more opportunity this next year. Tank Dell, we saw the spike. We saw it looking great, um, but coming off that injury, can he sustain it? Pretty much all the same questions we have for Nico Collins, except we just didn't see it as much as long from Tank Dell. And then two older guys, Debo Smith and Stephon Diggs. Obviously, Diggs fell off at the end of this last year, but I still think he's a pretty elite guy, elite player. He's just going to be 29 years old. And then Debo Samuel, who was good this year. He just wasn't fantastic. Um, maybe he you know, gets better with Brandon Ayuk out, but he falls in as a wide receiver 24. All righty, guys, that wraps up our top 25 wide receivers in their tier list. Make sure to hit that notification button. Make sure to subscribe. And, yeah, that's all I got. Podcast coming out tomorrow. Top 15 tight ends coming out on Thursday. With that, deuces.